Let's let, a, let's let an echo of prayer begin to ring through this sanctuary tonight. God, we need you tonight. Let the Holy Ghost move tonight. Touch somebody's mind here tonight, God, that needs to hear your word. Speak to us tonight, God. Let us see a demonstration of your power. Let us see a demonstration of your anointing tonight, God. We need you in a mighty way. And I wonder if somebody could just put their hands together and give God a shout of praise for what he's going to do. Amen, amen. You may be seated tonight. The story began in Luke chapter number 1 as an angel appeared to a lady named Mary. We've all heard the story. It's very familiar. Amen. We celebrate the Christmas season every year based around this story. But an angel appears unto Mary and prophesies to her and tells her that she will conceive and bear a son and that they will call his name Jesus. And Mary all of a sudden begins to think back and she asked the angel, she said, but how, how will I conceive and bear a son? Because you see, Mary was still a virgin. It was impossible for her to bear a son. Some of us, when God begins to call us and he reaches down and says, I want you to do this or I want you to do that or I have an anointing or a calling for you to do something in the kingdom of God, sometimes we say, well, God, I've got this in my life, so how can I do it? It's an impossibility for me to accomplish what you want because I've had this past or I've done this in my life. And we come up with all kinds of excuses of why we can't fulfill the will of God. But no matter what the impossibility may seem, there is still a God that can use us in any situation. Because you see, Mary did conceive a son and did call his name Jesus. And I want to tell somebody here tonight that there is an anointing. There is a calling for someone here tonight that God wants to perform miracles through you. And God wants to do great things in your life. And maybe there's a young person here tonight that has visions and has dreams of what they want to do when they grow up. And I want to tell them tonight that God can still use them to do anything in his kingdom. No matter what kind of mistake they make. No matter what they choose to do in their life. There will still be mercy and God can still reach down and use them. So Mary conceives a son, calls his name Jesus, and as the story goes through one chapter, we, we kind of miss the first 12 years of Jesus' life. And I want to just kind of put my own uh, mythology on what happened through those 12 years. And I want to talk a little while that maybe Mary, I'm sure there was days that they had meals together. There was days that there was, um, as most young people, most children, there's mistakes that are made. And as PJ talked about, there was moments spent with dad in the basement. I don't know if Jesus was that way. They said he was perfect, so I don't know if Jesus was that kind of kid. <laughs> but nonetheless, there was days that Jesus spent out in the shop with Joseph, learning how to be a carpenter. There was days that they hopped in their chariot and went to town together to get their groceries. There was times if there was a lake there by dad, I'm sure they got on the edge of that lake and took their stick and their little string, whatever they had back then, and they didn't have all the fancy stuff that Brother Donnie's got now. It's, they had all the, just the simple stuff. But there was days that they, they just spent time together as a family. They did things together and as the 12 years began to grow, they, they, they began to, to form a great bond together. They, they knew each other. They knew each, what each other liked to eat. They knew where each other liked to go. They, they liked each other's hobbies. They knew what exactly everything about each other. You know how children can be. They, they can get along or they cannot get along. Parents can get along with their children. They cannot get along. Days go up and down. Emotions go up and down. And as those 12 years begin to go on, they begin to grow tighter and tighter and tighter. And the whole 12 years, Mary has this little thing in the back of her mind of that, that memory of that angel saying that Jesus was going to be the son of the highest. They remember that Jesus was going to be somebody great, that he was the son of man. And, and I'm sure there was a responsibility that Mary felt to teach him in the right way and tell him what to do and, and to show him the things that, to do and 
Joseph, no doubt, had to, had to remember every day that I've got to make a difference in Jesus' life. But then after the 12 years, we find that they made their annual trip to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. And as they, they do, went through the festivities, they ate their dinner, they went through everything that it was involved in the Passover. And then they left. There was not much that is said about the Passover. There's only one verse, and then it says that they packed up and went home. But on that journey home, they made it two days' journey, the Bible says, before they realized that Jesus was not with them. I kind of wonder... When you've been with the master for 12 years, when you've been with the one that God said he will be the son of man, when the angel said he will be something great and you got to know that man, you raised that man, you were with him every day for 12 years, how do you just leave without knowing that he is coming with you? How do you just leave town, pack up and say, okay, we're headed home for vacation now. Most of us would want our kids to be in the car when we go home. Yeah, Dad says sometimes. <laughs> but if you have the responsibility of raising the Son of Man, you would think that there would be a little bit of responsibility to make sure that He is with you. If God has given you a calling, if God has given you an anointing and a responsibility to the kingdom of God, you would kind of think uh, that there would be a responsibility to think uh, that Jesus is still with me. After 12 years, they just forget Jesus. They forget him in Jerusalem. Because why? They were caught up in their own doings. They just got caught up in making sure that the chariots were hooked up. They got caught up in thinking and, and wondering, well, do I have this? And did I get these groceries? And did I, did I do this right? And did I, did I make the right preparations? Do we, do we have all the family? Do we have everybody here? And then they get two days journey. Jesus isn't there. So tonight, I want to preach to somebody here tonight that maybe we've been a little bit complacent with Jesus. We're used to just having Jesus right there. Because the Bible says that Mary just assumed that she was that Jesus was in one of the chariots with the other family. He, she just assumed that he was there. And sometimes we can get that way in our walk with God. That we just assume that God is with us. We just assume that he's by our side every day of every minute. But he wasn't there. So tonight I want to ask somebody a very important question. Somebody that has took a wrong road and you've walked away and you've, you've, you've made your own decisions. I want to talk to some young people tonight that when you meet that, that crossroads and that, that fork in the road of what you're going to do and, and you, you begin to branch out and you start your own family and you make your own decisions and, and you get caught up in where you're going to go to school and you get caught up in who you're going to marry and you get caught up in, in where you're going to live and what kind of car you're going to drive and what you're going to do in church or maybe if you're not even going to be in church and you get caught up in all these little things and I've come to ask somebody a very important question. Maybe somebody that's getting ready to realize that, that's getting ready to leave Jerusalem or maybe tonight I'm preaching to some Somebody that's already left Jerusalem and you're already two days gone and I've come to ask you a very important question where did you leave Jesus where did you leave him do you know where he was the last time that you saw him do you know where he was the last time you felt his presence The Bible tells us that Mary, when she realized that she was sorrowful, she was sorrowful that Jesus was not there. And maybe tonight I'm preaching to somebody that you realize that Jesus is not there and you become sorrowful and you begin to feel the pain and the misery of not feeling Jesus. And I've come to ask you, where was he the last time you saw him? Do you remember exactly where he was? And the reason that that question is so important tonight is because the Bible tells us uh, that when they went back to Jerusalem to find him, it says they spent three 
days looking for Jesus. And after the three days, they finally found him in the temple. I think the three days is important because a lot of times when we reach, reach that crossroads that we realize that our, our life is in a, a mess, it's in a turmoil, we reach that point that we know that Jesus is not there. Oftentimes we'll run to every little thing. We'll run over to this corner and try to find him. And we'll try to run to this person and try to find him. And we'll run to this drug and try to find him. And we'll run to this store and this place. And before we know it, we're lost in three days. And still can't find Jesus. But tonight I want to preach to somebody. That if you've lost Jesus, uh, if you've left him somewhere, uh, I can promise you that you will find him uh, in the temple. You can still find him uh, sitting at an altar uh, with the scribes. Uh, you can still find him in the old rugged cross. Mary says, Jesus, what are you doing? We've been looking for you. Jesus looks back with kind of a smart alecky attitude like some of us had when we were teenagers and says, well, did you not know that I was being about my father's business? He was letting Mary know while you were out doing your own thing, while you were out making your own decisions, while you were out doing what you wanted to do without asking me first, I was still doing the father's will. I was still doing what God wanted me to do, but where did you go? Uh, why, do you, why were you wondering uh, where I was? I was still right where I needed to be. Uh, I was doing what the Father wanted me to do, and I've come to preach to somebody that if you, if you found yourself lost, uh, if you found yourself without Jesus, just get back uh, doing the Father's business. Uh, just get back uh, doing what God wanted you to do. The scripture we read tonight, there is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There is a way that seems right unto us. There is a way that we will find in our life that it just feels right just to go with this. It just feels right to go here, and it just feels right to date this person, and it just feels right to go here. But the Bible says there is a way. It seems right, but it's really not. If you take that road without Jesus, the Bible promises that the ways thereof are of death. Sometimes, like Mary, we want to we wanna get mad and say, Jesus, why didn't you follow me? Why weren't you with me when I wanted to leave? Sometimes we can grab Jesus. All right, Jesus, come on. Come on. We're going back home, and we're going to lead Jesus back home. We're going to take him where we, no, we're going to go this way now, Jesus. We're going to go over here, and, and we're going to go see this, and uh, we're going to do this in our life. And all the while, Jesus is saying, no, uh, I'm about doing my father's business. Uh, I'm about doing what God wants me to do. So I want to preach to somebody tonight. Uh, don't walk away uh, from what God wants you to do. Uh, he wants you to be in the father's business. Don't just choose your own way. Don't just do what feels right. But get on an altar. Get on your knees in a prayer room. Seek some counsel from the pastor and say, God, I want to be in your will. God, I want to do what you want me to do. I don't want to just lead Jesus around, but I want to go where Jesus wants me to go. I want to say what Jesus wants me to say. I want to do what Jesus wants me to do. So you say, preacher, I see all these other people that they just come and go. They, they, they went, everybody else went to Jerusalem. Everybody else went to the Passover. Everybody else went through the ceremony. Everybody else went through the rituals. Everybody else left. And they didn't return sorrowful. Everybody else walked away from Jerusalem and they didn't come back asking for Jesus. As a young person, it's easy to say, well, preacher, everybody else just comes and just gets a feel good and goes home and does whatever they want. Everybody else can live a life of sin and nothing bad happens to them. Why am I so different? 
Why is it going to be a problem if I do what they're doing? I would propose tonight that the reason it's a problem is everybody else didn't have the same calling that Mary had. Everybody else didn't have Jesus living in their home for 12 years. It makes a difference when you've had Jesus in your life. It makes a difference when you've had Jesus when you eat, Jesus when you sleep, uh, Jesus when you're doing the things in your life, and then all of a sudden he's gone. It makes a difference compared to everybody else that's never had that opportunity. You say, preacher, is it really going to make that big of a difference? Is it really going to hurt that bad if I just realize that he's not there and I just keep the chariot pointed back towards Galilee? If I just keep on that same road that I go and I just forget that Jesus was back in Jerusalem, and I just don't worry about it anymore, is it really going to be that bad? I would direct your attention to the book of Zephaniah. Because God didn't pull any punches when he began to see that people had walked away from him. Because in them, he begins to talk about how the wrath of the Lord is going to consume all of these people. And he tells us why in verse number 6, he says, Them that are turned back from the Lord, and those that have not sought the Lord, nor inquired for him. So what's going to happen to those people? Verse number 10, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that there shall be the noise of a cry from the fish gate, and then howling from the second, and a great crashing from the hills. Verse number 13, Therefore their goods shall become a booty, and their houses a desolation. They shall also build houses, but not inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards, but not drink the wine thereof. The great day of the Lord is near, it is near, and hasteth greatly even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, uh, a day of trouble and distress, uh, a day of wastedness uh, and desolation, uh, a day of darkness and gloominess, uh, a day of clouds and thick darkness, uh, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities uh, and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men uh, that they shall walk like blind men uh, because they have sinned against the Lord. And their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung. But notice this verse. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. So if you are wondering tonight if just walking away from Jerusalem and leaving Jesus in Galilee. If you want to be like verse number 6 and be a part of those that turn back from the Lord and those that sought not the Lord, he tells us very clearly that it will not be a pleasant day when he comes back. It won't be a pleasant day when his anger and his wrath is kindled against the children of Israel. Then we go to chapter number 2. Verse number three, he says, But seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness, that it may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. So tonight, I'm pulling for somebody tonight that you're weighing in that balance. Do I go back to Jerusalem or do I just stay on this road? Do I go back and try to find Jesus back where I left him? Or do I just keep doing my own thing? Do I just keep going here and going there and dating this person and doing this and doing that? Do I just keep on that road? Or do I turn back and say, God, I'm coming back to Jerusalem. I'm going to make my way back to the temple. I may be crying. I may leave a trail of tears all the way back two days' journey, but 
I'm coming back. I'm going to find my way back to the temple and I'm going to fall on my knees and say, Jesus, where were you? Where were you? But tonight, somebody needs to think back and remember where you left Jesus because he's still there and he's still waiting. I heard one preacher say it like this, that most of the time when you see a man backslide from church and begin to do his own thing, while he is out doing his own thing and hooks up with a, a girl from in the world from another church, what usually happens when a man that has a calling and an anointing upon his life that is running away from Jerusalem and he hooks up with somebody that's already in Galilee, what usually happens? That young girl usually has to find her way back to Jerusalem to find out what that man actually had. The reason why because when that man gets back to Galilee and he's living in the pain and the misery of what the choices that he made, coming back to Jerusalem to find the reason is her only chance of survival. And I want to preach to somebody tonight. When you get to that crossroads, don't just keep walking. Don't just keep walking and forget about what was back there. But I'm praying tonight, I'm begging somebody that's in this sanctuary tonight, whether you're getting ready to leave Jerusalem or whether you're already a two days journey, turn around and say, Jesus, I'm coming back. I'm coming back once again and saying, God, come with me. Come with me. I'm nearing a close. Musicians want to come. If we could all stand all over this sanctuary. I wonder if we could just lift our hands for a moment. I wonder if somebody could lift their voice right now. There is a heaviness of the anointing that's here tonight. Come on, somebody just lift up your voice for a moment. I'm not going to give an altar call right now, but somebody just lift up your voice. Somebody's weighing in the balance. What am I going to do? I wish I had some people that would begin to intercess for somebody here tonight. Somebody cry out. God, reach. Let mercy reach, God. Somebody just, if you're filled with the Holy Ghost, just let it flow right now. Let the Spirit do a work. Let the Holy Ghost do a work right now that we couldn't do. God, reach down in this sanctuary right now. Pull on a heart and a mind, God. Give them clarification right now that they need to turn back to Jerusalem. the end of the story the Bible tells us that Mary grabs Jesus and takes him back to Galilee so that he could continue to learn and grow in his stature but tonight we don't have the privilege of just grabbing Jesus and going our way because even though that's what it happened in that story but that story is over Jesus has grown into his full stature. Jesus has learned what he needed to learn. And tonight I'm talking about a Jesus that has already been tempted and tried. 
I'm talking about a Jesus that has already performed the miracle. I'm talking about a Jesus that was already crucified on the cross. But I'm also talking about a Jesus that rose on the third day. And it's a Jesus that's already in heaven. Looking down on each and every one of us saying, Son, daughter, calling us by name. Saying, which way are you going to choose? Do you remember where you left me? Do you remember the anointing that used to be there? Do you remember the calling that I gave you as a young child? Do you remember that calling that I gave you when you first came to this church? Do you remember the excitement when God gave you that first assignment? Do you remember where it was? Do you remember how to get back there? Tonight, that same Jesus that's already been through all of that is looking down and saying, are you going to come back? Are you going to come back to Jerusalem? Or are you just going to go your own way and live your own life? Hope you can figure it out. But there's no money. There's no knowledge. There's no intelligence. That can do what Jesus can do in your life. I wonder if everybody, everybody hands could be lifted right now. In this sanctuary right now, God, I poured out my spirit tonight. I poured out the word that you have spoken to me. But I pray right now, God, that you would begin to do your work on somebody's mind. God, that right now that you would do the work that you would pull on their minds. If you're in that balance tonight, if you're in that crossroads right now, I wonder if somebody could find an altar. I'm begging somebody tonight could be that moment of decision. Tonight could be that point that you decide either I'm going to walk, going back to Galilee, going back to everything that I know isn't right. Or I'm going to go back to Jerusalem. I'm going to make my way back to an altar. And I'm going to find, I'm going to find what God had for me. I'm going to find what God had in store. I wonder if somebody would come to an altar right now. I'm begging somebody don't make that decision to walk back to Galilee. But I'm begging somebody tonight, come back to Jerusalem. Come back to the temple and find Jesus where you left him. Come on, somebody. He's still here. He's still here waiting. He's still here doing the Father's business. Uh, if you're scared that the calling's not there anymore, I've come to tell you that there is still a calling. That anointing is still there waiting for you to pick it back up and say it's mine. But I'm sure, I'm sure if you don't want to come back to Jerusalem, somebody will. Somebody will take on that responsibility. Somebody will be there to pick up the torch. But I'm begging somebody, don't let somebody steal. It was originally yours. Come back to the temple and claim it. Come back to the temple and say, God, this is mine. I'm going to hold on to it. Come on, the Holy Ghost is here tonight. Mercy is here tonight. If you need him here tonight, he's here. Don't leave Jerusalem without finding him. Don't leave. Don't leave without knowing that Jesus is in your chariot. <laughs>